Welcome to our study in the book of Romans. This is the Romans Education Part 1, and this is going to be Session 9. Now, everything that I'm about to tell you right here at the outset, by way of introducing this lesson, has everything to do with what you're going to be studying, uh, in, starting here in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, and continuing on down through this first section where we're studying godly wisdom. And, and I don't want you to think that, oh, you know, we're just kind of reviewing something. I'm actually taking something we've already learned, and we're going to bring it in to something because what you're going to see today is fantastic. You already know, all, you already have all the parts to it. So today what we're going to do is just put all the parts together and when you see it come together, I promise you, you're never going to look at your Bible the same way anymore. Have you ever had one of those times where you said, you know, I read that verse and I read that verse, but when we went over it, all of a sudden, I see something that wasn't there before. And it, yeah, and, and you know, and you wonder about that. Well, let me tell you, you that's about to change for you after today. Because today you're going to get the framework for how this was written and you're going to be able to see the entire education this way because this thing is going to repeat itself over and over. In fact, there's not a single part of the education that isn't written this way. So this is a marvelous thing that we're going to be looking at. So just to, just to start us off, remember we just came out of that checkpoint in Romans 12, 1 and 2 and really all that checkpoint was doing was asking us to walk worthy of the sons that we've been made to be. And who is that? Justified, sanctified sons in this dispensation of grace. That's really all that that's doing is checking us out on that issue. That's what is at the core of that thing. Now. On your note taker, I'm almost ready to take you to your note taker, but remember the last part of that, that checkpoint, uh, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and we talked about that's what the Sonship education was going to do. That, that issue of being able to prove, I don't have that verse up, and I started to put it in your notes, but I just wanted to mention it, because I want you to see how good this really is. I, I'm afraid that what I did was I bogged you down in details and we lost the, the, a, a little bit of the enthusiasm for this education. Maybe you didn't personally, but kind of the way I'm doing the session, I, I kind of let that, I don't know, kind of overwhelm the session a little bit. What is being said to us that we're going to be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? is a huge issue. Not only is it grand, because we're actually going to be able to do that, but this is something that could never ever have been said to anyone in Israel's program. You realize this is something that could not have been said to Moses. This is somewhat, something that could not be said to Abraham. This is, this, is an this is something that couldn't have been said to Elijah. Can you imagine? He is telling us something that we're going to be able to do that none of those guys were able to do. And it's because we're in this dispensation of grace. So what I'm trying to do with that is at the start of this session, kind of rev up our enthusiasm for how great this thing really is that we're able uh, to engage in. And that we're going to be able to prove God's will all on our own. And here's, here's what you're going to be able to do. Let's suppose that you have a decision that you're going to make. Whatever that decision is, let's say that you have three, you have three ways that you could decide about something in your life. And it doesn't matter what it is. This is great. This is leading right into where we're going. This decision you're going to have to make, when you get the sonship education, you're going to be able to weigh every... Look... Do you remember when you, um, we talked about that word prove 
that it means some, that there, there's a meaning of prove that means you're able to, to take something and put it to the test to see if it really does, you know, if it is what it said it to be or if it can do what they say it will do. Well, when you have a decision to make, here's what you're going to be able to do. You're going to be able to take the sonship education and you're going to be able to take that decision and weigh it against the things that you've learned as a son, being educated. And then you're going to take the second option and, and weigh it against those things. And then you'll take the third option and weigh it. I'm trying to show you there's a process. Because last time when I told you, you know, you're going to know God's, you're going to know what your father would do. This is how you will know it. You're actually going to be able to take every possible decision you could make Put it into the, you know what, I, I, started, I thought, what if we had a little box up here and we just called it the education machine? You'd be able to just drop that thing into the machine and the education will process that and spit out, you know, kind of the robot thing there, spit out, you know, what, that, what, what you would think about that. How does your father think about that? And that means that's how you'll be thinking about it. You'll see that for every single decision. So I wanted to just take a moment and talk about that because it's not magic. It's education. That's all. You're taking that education, and that education is a, now able to look at every one of those decisions and go, you know what, my father wouldn't do this one, and here's why. The educational... Te do you see that? Okay, so I, I just wanted to kind of... I don't think I've ever really talked about it that way and this seemed to be a clearer, clearer way of doing that and, uh, and, and really that's just, that's just what you do as a son this is just going to become part and parcel of what you're going to do all the time every day as a son and that's what adoption is about and, and as you know most people don't understand that properly they think that means you're part of the family of God but you got that solved back in your justification. This is being a son now and that you're being equipped to labor with your father. I really wish folks understood that better. When you get that concept, it makes all the difference uh, in the world. Okay, now, <clears throat> that, that education. Now, when I said this, you're going to be able to take this education and you're going to, uh, we're just, I'm just going to call it the EDU. You're going to evaluate every one of these by the education that you're going to get that's, that's the way you're going to get taught sonship. That's why he couldn't do this with Israel. You, if I was to ask you, why couldn't he deal with Israel as adult adopted sons, you would say what? They were under the law. And what did the law do? It told you what you had to do and what you were not supposed to do. So if... When you get to wisdom, when we get into the study of godly wisdom, and he begins to teach us this now, what you might expect is he's going to tell us what wisdom is, and then he's going to give us these are wise things and these are not wise things. But if he does it that way, you know what he's doing? He's putting you back under a law system again of do's and don'ts. Instead, he's going to teach you principles that apply to any situation so he doesn't have to come along look what if I taught you math like this don't worry about how we get there just remember this one plus one is two and we never talk about what two is we don't you know illustrate it out and just remember this don't worry about how we get there eight divided by four is two if you just had to memorize every single mathematical thing that you would ever encounter, how difficult would that be? Instead, you know how you learned math? By principle and concept. And so you learned your numbers, and then you learned how those numbers related to each other, and then you were able to take any set of numbers. See, you never could... If, someone, if, if, if Bertha says to Karen, hey, add these four numbers up for me, and Karen writes them down, she's not going to look at that and go, well, I've never seen these four numbers together before. I can't do this. It's no problem. Why? Because she has the concept down. 
By the way, the basic things that you're learning here in Romans 12, 3 and, and, and on, they are the basic. It, it, you're going to be a simple son at the end. But do you realize that even when you do trigonometry or algebra or I, I, any of the advanced math, you still have to come back and grab those first simple things in order to do those. All you did was add other concepts to them. So you're never going to get rid of this. So I don't, I'm saying that to keep you from thinking that, well, what we're learning here is just so basic. I'm just going to move past that. We'll never see it again. You are going to see, you're going to see this forever uh, in, in your sonship life. And that's the point that I made. When I was talking in your notes about Israel was, were, were being treated as children because they're under the law because they're given a list of do's and don'ts, he can't teach you wisdom that way because that's not how you get educated. That won't work. By the way, if he was doing it that way, if, if the Bible was nothing but a list of everything you could or couldn't do, do you know how big this book would be? It'd look like a set of encyclopedias, and it'd be growing all the time. To a, and, and What if someone came along and said, I've got these do's and don'ts, but there's nothing in here about the Internet. Well, your father doesn't need to talk about the Internet to you. Why? Because you've got principles that will let you make a decision about any arena of your life. It doesn't matter that none of the Bible writers knew about computers. It doesn't matter. Because the principles will, will remain the same. Okay. Sorry. I was looking at last week's notes. They came out of my Bible and suddenly I'm looking at a different set of notes and I thought, what is that? <laughs> It said page 17. I thought, what is that? Okay. All right. So <clears throat> now, now these principles that we're about to learn are the way that we're going to put our new identity into practice. That thing that we learned way back there in Romans 6, 7, and 8, now we're going to put that into practice. Okay. Now, in order to do this, and I started to put this on your, on your um, note taker, but I decided to just tell you about it. I want to make sure that you understand what this is supposed to do. You need to be able to articulate this clearly. What this sonship, sonship education is going to do for us. And so, if I had to just ask you, what do you think this sonship education would do for you? I mean, you know some things already. What will it do? All right, we'll, we'll begin to see things from our Father's perspective. It's certainly going to do that. Uh, <clears throat> it's going to teach us godliness, yes. It's going to teach us what's important, what our Father values and esteems. All, all, all those things are exactly right. Th this is going to, and, and I don't, I, you've, you've already said all the things that I've written in the notes about this because it's going to give you the insight and the perception that you need to be able to know I exactly what, what your father's will would be a and those doctrines are going to renew our mind. You could have said any of those things and I think you understand those things. And, and, and that process of learning what our father values and esteems is going to become what we value and esteem. The curriculum is going to do that. And that's what's going to renew our mind. Okay, now I think everybody's kind of got that. That is, that is effectual working. Now, let me tell you how we're going to approach this section of Scripture. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a broad view at it and just see, you've already done this last week, so this, this I'll only mention this. This first section I told you ran from, in fact, let me just look at the, I'm close to your note taker, let's just do it this way. As, as we do this on your note taker, you need to understand that, well, let me just do it. Here we go. Wisdom is what runs from Romans chapter 12, verse 3 to 16. Now, if you haven't already filled that in, then, then you can do that now. And for those of you that are reading in the book of Romans, and I hope all of you are reading at least these first 16 verses over and over and over again. And for some of you, you may be going right on through to the end of the book of Romans. That's fine. 
What you're going to learn today is how to put all of that in a framework, and now when you go back and look at that, you're going to be doing something you never did before. This is going to be great. My only fear is you're going to get so good at this, you're going to go, we don't need Mike anymore. Okay, you know, you know what? Sit down. We got this. But, <laughs> so I'm talking myself out of a job here. But, but this, this is the way that you're going to see the Scripture now. This is why before, when you read it, you said, I read it, but until we went through it, I didn't even see that before. This is now how you're going to see it. Justice is the next one you know. And I'm just breaking this down for you so that now when you read, this is the beginning of your frame of reference. This is Romans 12, verses 17 to chapter 3 and verse 7. The next one, of course, is judgment. That's Romans chapter 13. And that's going to run from verses 8 to 14. That's the one where you're going to get another promotion. Now, you've already gotten a couple of promotions. You got saved, but the day you said, Abba, Father, you got a promotion. Because then you put yourself in a position th that a son is really supposed to be in. When you went to Romans 12, 1 and 2, you got another promotion. Now you're going to start the education. And when you get to Romans 13, you're going to get another promotion. And when you get that promotion, that's when you really begin to shine. Because you're going to put on the armor of light. And then some other things happen. And then the last one is equity. And that is Romans chapter 14, verse 1, to chapter 15 and verse 7. Now you've heard me say to you before that when you get to the end of, of this education, <laughs> look, this is so great. Sometimes you hear me say something, but later it makes sense. And I'm only saying it based on something I already know is out there. But when you, when you get to the end of it, did you ever wonder, why doesn't equity, why didn't that take me all the way to the end of chapter 16? Or why is there something else following the end of my education, godly equity, because there's only four decision-making skills. You're not going to get any more, ever. Everything's going to be built on those four. So what else are we doing here? When you get to 15.7, because of what you will know, you are going to say, it, well, I say you're going to say. You won't say it because you already know about it because we're talking about it now. And you'll see your Bible goes on to verse 8 and, and 9 and 10 and then into 16. But if, if someone was just kind of covering it up and all they gave you was the 15.7, you would be thinking there has to be something else that's said to me at this point. You, you can't just leave me here. You've got to tell me something else. Well, would you like to see what the something else is? So let me break that down for you. So here we are. Romans chapter 15, verses 8 to 33. Those are a reiteration of the dispensational change and not just the dispensational change, but Paul's unique apostleship, his authority in connection with that dispensational change. Why does he go through that again? Because that is one of those issues that is a specialty issue for the adversary. And he is going to bring that back up to make sure because there's an attack coming your way. The very in fact, it's one of the first things you're going to encounter. And guess what arena that attack is going to be in? That right there. You're going to be tempted now. There's going to be something that's going to come up that's going to try to move you back into the, uh, uh, out of the dispensation of grace and back into some area of Israel's program or to take part of that and import it into the dispensation of grace. Paul is bringing that up again and then, and really, well, let me just give you this next one because, well, before I give you this next one, let me just cl clarify something here. What God is doing in this dispensation of grace is He is putting something on display, right? And that's it happening in us. 
That's in us. And there's two things that he's doing. And you should be able to call them out very quickly. Here they are. Number one, he is quickening our mortal bodies so that we don't have to obey sin anymore. That's the first thing. The second thing he's doing is he is putting the power of his grace on display in the endurance of the sufferings that come our way. Now those are two things that he's doing in this dispensation of grace that he can only do if he doesn't redeem this body. So he didn't redeem it on purpose to do those two things. What's happening in this dispensation of grace in accordance with that is something that couldn't happen any other time. But now it's happening with us. And that's supposed to be, and, that, and that's a huge issue, and Satan wants to move you out of that issue. Now I'm going to come back and talk about that again in just a moment. But those things are so important that Paul is bringing that up again in this whole section, and he talks about that and his apostleship. Now, here's the next thing. Romans chapter 16 Verses 1 to 16, Paul is going to talk about his godly love for the saints at Rome. And he's not just, let me just say some nice things to y'all. He is actually demonstrating some of the very things we will have already been taught. So you know what he's given us a chance to do? He's given us a chance to see him put that, what's effectually worked in him, into action. And you're going to get an example of it. I mean, that's really great. It's, uh, uh, when I was in math class, I always looked forward to give me the example. Now you told me about it. Show me how this works. And that's what Paul is going to do. Now really, I could have taken that further. I could have taken that to verse 20. Because what he does in those next verses really is an example of his godly love for them. I separated that out because in this particular instance, look what else he's doing here. He is warning them and instructing them concerning phase one of Satan's policy of evil against them, which means when we get there, he's going to be instructing and warning us about phase one of Satan's policy of evil against us. This is... What I've just talked to you about is part of what you'd have been looking at and saying, I need something more than just cutting me off here at the end of equity. You've got to show me something else. So <clears throat> that just leaves us then, oh, by the way, and I do want to take this as the opportunity to talk about this. When the children of Israel went down into Egypt, they were small in number, just a handful. When they came out of Egypt, they were increased. They were, like, they were a whole nation of people. Uh, so much so that, remember, one of the things that Pharaoh said was, there's more of them than there is of us. We better do something about this because if they ever line up with enemies that come against us, you know, we've had it. And so they put them into that iron furnace of Egypt. You know, Satan, that was Satan's ploy. He was content for them to be there and serve the Egyptians. But the trouble started from him, really, when they moved out of Egypt. And they, they, when they get to the Red Sea, do you remember we talked about this back when we did the thing on the power of the crucifixion? Now, that was only, that was only six years ago. So you should remember this like yesterday. But do you remember when they were crossing the Red Sea? They were crossing the Red Sea at a particular point. God parted those waters, and there was an opening into the pit that Satan really wanted. When the children of Israel got to that area, he wanted to open that pit and drop them into that pit. And God congealed, remember? He congealed that, and they went right across on dry ground. That was a provoking concept that happened to the adversary there. Now, that's not the part that I'm after. The idea is this. Once they're leaving out of Egypt, why is Satan now so... And when Pharaoh and his army are coming after them, is he coming after them to bring them back or to kill them? Kill them. To kill them. And when Satan's going to drop them into the pit, he's not wanting to get them back into Egypt. He's just wanting to get rid of them. 
Why now is there so much emphasis on annihilating Israel? What's happened? They're headed toward the land. And why is that a big deal to Satan? Okay, because he, well, he knows once they get into that land, does he know what God has planned to do with them? Yes. So what he's done is he's thinking, when they start moving toward the land, big trouble. Not only that, what's been happening in the land all this time? He's, he's had control there, and he's been filling that land with corruption and evil and defilement. So he's trying to get a hold in the land, and he's trying to keep them from heading to the land because he knew if they ever get into that land, that's the next step toward setting up that kingdom and, and once that kingdom gets set up in the land, he's a toehold away from losing the possession of the earth. So, you know, he's got to keep them out of that land. And, and now he's thinking, and in case they get there, I've got to do some things in this land to keep possession of it. So you know what he does? Those races of giants are in that land. Did that spook them? You bet. When they came back, remember the 12 spies and 10 of them said... Hey, it's a land that's flowing with milk, and hey, we can't go in there. There's giants in there. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. We can't take that land. And because of unbelief, remember, they stumbled and were blinded. Remember, we went through that issue. All right, now that's what Satan knew. Does he know where you're headed? He knows you're headed for the creature. And here's what I'm going to propose to you. What, based on what you know he was doing in that land, because he knew what was going to take place there, and now, because Paul has revealed the mystery, him and, you know, five other guys, <laughs> no, there's more than that, Paul has revealed the mystery, does Satan know what the plan is when we get up there, what we're going to do? So would it, it makes sense to say, just as he polluted and defiled that land to try to keep, without him personally being involved, trying to keep a hold on that land, don't you reckon he's doing the same thing in the creature? You know he is. And so, since he can't stop you from getting a glorified body, since he can't stop you from getting into the heavenly places, the next best thing is what? Yes, to stop your education because if you can get up there but you don't have any idea what you're doing when you get there, that's almost as good as you not getting there. And that's, that's really where he's going with this for us. This is what he's about. And I've taken the opportunity here to say Phase one of Satan's policy of evil, and this won't surprise you, is to get you to stop where you are and not go any further. And that happens right there in Romans 13. And that's why when you put on that armor of light, you get another promotion. But that promotion now puts you on the front lines. And it's no longer, I mean, it's not going to be, it's not going to be theory for you now either, but I mean, as far as dealing with him, by the way, <clears throat> I've said some things in the past that kind of didn't articulate it as perfectly as it needed to be. It's not that, because I use this terminology in Romans 13, that's when we get on Satan's radar. But that, that's really too loose of a terminology. That's when he actually gets the green light now to do something with us. I believe he already knows about this assembly. I believe he already has been informed that we've made the cry of Abba Father, that we've gone through the checkpoint, and now here we are entering into the education. I don't think any of that has gone by him. 
he's just not allowed to do the specific things he would like to do yet. And that's what I meant when I was talking about we get on his radar. It's not that he's just completely ignoring us or, you know, or doesn't care. He cares about, look, children of Israel get to the Red Sea. You know what? They're on the border of the land of Egypt. And he cares already. The fact that you've made the cry of Abba Father and you've gone through the sonship checkpoint and now you're in the education, he cares about that. Okay, so I just wanted to make that clear. In fact, let me give you this thing here because in that sea, what was he called? Leviathan. Now, I bring you to Isaiah 27, 1. In that day, the Lord with the sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. And, and that's, I, I understand that that's an advent clause, but if you went over to Psalm 74, and I didn't give you the verses on this because I didn't mean to get too far afield with this, but in Psalm 74, you know what it talks about? It talks about him uh, breaking or wounding the head of Leviathan in those waters. What was the wounding of Leviathan? It was when they, and it talks about in conjunction with the children who were in the wilderness. It was back then at the crossing of the Red Sea. Those things were, that was all a setup for, for the things that were happening back there. Okay, so now having said that, let me just get back to my notes here and see where we are. Let me give you this last one. And by the way, that policy of evil will continue throughout the dispensation of grace and continue throughout our sonship education. And although the education can handle everything that's coming your way, not only will you be given what you need to handle it, you'll be informed about the attack before... You'll know the form of that before it ever takes place. So you're, it's... It's like your father's going to fill you in on everything. You're just going to have to use the education, though, to be able to endure that. And, and that is going to be there. But I don't want to give you the idea that this is just going to be a bed of roses. It is still a satanic attack. Okay, now, here's the last one, I think, in this part of your note taker. Romans 16, 21 to 27. Paul is going to come back at the end, and he's going to underscore the design and the purpose for the epistle. And, and, and what he's doing there is he is making sure that, and I, and I may be getting ahead of myself here because I sure thought I had a verse here on this, so maybe it's, maybe it's later on. But he is making sure that we are established. And I'm gonna, I, I think that verse is actually going to show up a little later on. So let me just, well, I'll just trust that it is. And if it isn't, then I'll... I'll do it at the end or something. But when he first starts out this, the, the Romans, when he first starts out in Romans, in Romans 1, he says he was writing so that they might be established. But when he gets to the end of Romans, he drops the E off the word. Because established is not the same thing as established. Those are words, uh, we, we don't use this in our common vocabulary anymore, but the, the actual difference is this. To be established is to get it going. To be established is to be stabilized after it's going. So it assumes that establishment has already taken place, and now some things have happened, and you need to be stabilized. And that's the things that after the education, those things are going to do, they're going to stabilize us into that. Does everybody see that? Okay. So now, in the, if this is going to be a godly wisdom, then let me give you these definitions real quickly. George Smith says that wisdom makes us think and act to the purpose. And this is going to be an edu this first part of the education is godly wisdom. Yes, we talked last time about he's using godly love to do it, but I want you to see what wisdom is so you'll understand something more about that godly love. Make us think and act to the purpose. Wisdom seeks to find the right way for accomplishing its ends. That's two different things there, by the way, we just read. And wisdom is reason made perfect by knowledge. Then, in the Oxford English Dictionary, wisdom is good judgment. And you know what that really tells you? It reminds you that all four of these decision-making skills of wisdom, justice, I might as well put them up because we'll refer to them over and over here, 
judgment, and equity, all of those have something in common. They're decision-making skills. And so when he says wisdom is good judgment, it means you're making a, a decision about something. One more, and this is Webster's 1928, and that, and that says wisdom is the right use or exercise of knowledge. So it's not just, wisdom isn't just data, but it's knowing how to use that information that you've been given. Okay, now we, just, we, we went back, and I, I didn't put this in your, uh, uh, in your note taker, and I didn't put it in the PowerPoint, but we actually had this technical definition of wisdom that we came up with back when we were in Sonship Orientation, and that is, well, you, you can read that in your notes. It's not important for me to reread that to you. But we, I did want to remind you that when people talk about wisdom, especially, um, especially under the systematic theology, we thought about wisdom as the apex. Once you, you know, once you got wisdom, that was it. There wasn't anything higher. But remember, you can have wisdom at every level of an education. Can't a first grader demonstrate wisdom that enables him to go on to the second grade? And, and he gets more wisdom in the second grade, but that doesn't mean he didn't have any wisdom in the first grade. It just means he's gotten additional things. So don't think of wisdom as, oh, that, once I get wisdom, that's all there is to it, because you're gonna, you're gonna, you, you already have some wisdom now, you're going to get more in the education, and it'll continue to be that way throughout the process. You are going to encounter now what we call a form, a form of doctrine. You're going to identify the forms, and that's what I'm about to show you how to do. This is that framework that I talked about easier. Uh, uh, I talked about earlier. <laughs> I talked about easier. Hmm. It is going to make it easier for you, but it's what I talked about earlier. And you're going to begin to notice some patterns, or as I'm going to call it in the notes, a common thread that begins to run through things. This is the way you're going to be able to start looking at the Scripture. Now, right now, what we're going to do is I'm going to take you back. Can, if you've got your Bible, just open up your Bible to Romans 12, if you don't already have it open to there. Look, Romans 12, and I asked you last time, I, I, I kind of wish I'd have done this differently and saved it till today, but you've, you've already been shown this, so okay. But when you look at those, I told you this section ended in verse 16, and I just told you that, and for now you're just taking my word for it. And I said we'd, we'd cover the change when we got there, and you'd see justice start up in verse 17. But... And, and well, look. Let me just look, look at verse 17 um, in Romans chapter. Well, I'm in First Corinthians 12. Hold it. In Romans 12, if you look at verse uh, 17, recompense. You, you know what? That, that's a legal term. When you recompense someone, recompense no man evil for evil. That's just, can you see how that's justice? That's determining how, how we deal with people in, in an area of justice. The first word turns your attention that way. Now, we'll do more work on that when we get over there. But I'm just trying to show you, I'm, we're not just pulling this out of the blue, that it runs from 3 to 16. But remember, I ask you to look at that and determine where between verse 3 and verse 16 did you see a major break? And we did last week. And we saw that major break happen. Well, the break happens right there between verse 8 and 9. That, that first part, verses 3 to 8. So let me see if I can just put this up here. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 to 8 is the first major section. And... Um, Verses 9 to 16 is the second major section. The first thing that you're taught to do, look, let me just show you something. 
Because before you can do anything, God has to talk, influence your thinking, right? This whole thing is to get you thinking His way. And so take a look at Romans 12, 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. We're not ready to break this verse down yet and look at the shade of meanings of these words and that kind of issue. What I just want you to see here is that right off the bat, he is talking to you about your, the way you're going to be thinking about things. He has told you what not to think, and he's told you something to be thinking. Because if you, if you do think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, then you're going to be thinking conformed to this world. That, remember, that's that, that whole context that we're looking at there. Okay, and so we're going to labor with our Father based on this new thinking. Now, later, here's what he's going to do. He's going to give you, uh, he's going to give you a form of doctrine. He's going to talk to you about the thinking in connection with that form of doctrine. And then at some point, he's going to come along and he's going to, he's going to tell you, this is how you're going to labor with me in thinking this way in this form of doctrine. He's going to lay all of that out for you. Oh, I'm just smiling to myself because I'm just thinking about how this is going and I'm trying not to give you answers, but I mean, but I am, but okay. We saw last time also that by not just going into this deal on wisdom, saying wisdom is this and wisdom is that and here's what a wise thing is, and instead of doing it that way, he took the issue of godly love. And I recognize that I told you that and that you may be looking at those first verses, from verses 3 to verse 8, and saying to yourself, I don't see the mention of love in there and I'm not sure how godly love is actually there. But that's because you don't have this framework in place that I'm just about to give you. And I'm not stalling because I'm changing my mind about giving it to you. It's because I'm trying to present this to you in a way that this will really, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I do it in, in a right order. Sometimes I put these notes together and I think everything moves from one thing to the next just right. And then I start doing it and I go, this doesn't, maybe I would change the order on this if I was doing this over. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just looking at this. So Romans chapter 3, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 3. Just take a look at this first section that we've identified. In fact, let me just put it here. This is going to be verses 3 to 8. Okay, now let's read through this together. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, rather prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth, on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him doeth with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Now, everything you just read, you may not realize it. What you just read enables you to do this. Verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Okay, look, now I'm going to tell you something very important. Think of this whole education. Remember, it's an edification. The root word is edifice, and edifice is a building. So think of a, a building or a house. Everything in that house is connected to other things in that house. When you, when you pour the concrete and you pour that concrete in there, then you know what? The, the studs that form the basis of the outside walls, you have to connect that to that foundation, especially if you live in Imperial, or it will blow away. Huh? 
Are you? Oh, okay. Oh, really? Oh, my goodness. Okay. I have three seconds. <laughs> okay, look, I need to go over just one. one I, Bob says I'm only 43 minutes in, so I'm going to take those two minutes. You ha everything is interconnected. Now, listen to me carefully. This is part of what you've got to get. Nothing in the education is standalone. Nothing. It's all connected to something else. And I'm going to show you how to identify those connections. Because when you see let love be without dissimulation, you're very tempted to think he's just... It, it's like, uh, like we read in Proverbs. It's just a bunch of different stuff and it doesn't have any relation to, to, to itself. But it does. This is connected to those previous verses because it's what's written in verses 3 to 8 that are allowing you to do verse 9. That's how connected that is. But because the word love didn't show up back there, you may not at first, I mean right now in the education, you might not be looking at that and going, that didn't talk to me a whole lot about love. But it was. It was. I'm, and, I'll, and I'll show you that. I'm, I'm sorry, now I'm up against this one minute thing in my head and now I'm panicked. Here's what, let me just do it like this. Verses 3 through 8 are going to form godly love in your inner man. After that's formed, then verse 9 is going to come along and tell you something about that love. Because you can't let love be anything until you've got it, right? And he's not talking about love in the way we have understood it up to this point in our lives. You love your family, and you should, but that's not what he's talking about. And you love God, and you should, but that's not what he's talking about. And you know God loves you, and he does, but that's not what he's talking about. When he's talking about godly love, that love that he's talking about can only be formed by these verses. Only. It's the only place you can learn it. You didn't hear it accidentally in college. You didn't hear it growing up in your home. And you're, I have more wild things to say about this, but we'll say it after the break because now I'm just going to lose track. Okay, so look, when we come back, we're straight into this, where we can, we can now begin to identify. In fact, I'm going to break it down for you. I'm going to walk you through the process. And when you see this, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to say, I already knew all that. And you did. You have all the pieces. You're just going to be able to now put them all together. And when we form this first picture, when you, when you leave today, you're going to get a homework assignment about taking another portion of Scripture, and you're going to do that work at home. And then when we come back, we'll see how well you did. It, it'll be great. You'll see. I mean, you know, it's easier than you think. All right. You're dismissed.